thanks for having me here. My name is Adam Greenberg, and I'm one of the co-founders of Sage City. Um, we're a local kind of company based here in Edinburgh and we're actually recently joined uh, the wire incubator down at the Bay Centre so we've got some kind of shiny new office space there which is quite nice. Um, yeah, first of all, um, you know, thanks for having me here um, and I really wanted, oh that's what I was going to say, um, you know, like uh, Jack, if anyone has any questions throughout the, the talk or whatever, like just jump straight in, um, there's not really you know, there are slides, but I'm also not going to be like mad strict with them or whatever. So, um, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, and what I wanted to really talk about today was, um, you know, kind of our insight on data and where it's headed. Um, and then also go into a little bit about what our platform actually is and how people can actually use it. So <coughs> one of the things that we're really focused on is uh, enterprise, but not just that, actually making real life impacts with the technology. So um, you'll see a bit more about that throughout the slides. So, um, you know, we've always talked about data and associated it with kind of like modern times, so computers, the digital age. Um, but, you know, to give it another name, data is basically information or, you know, facts. And, you know, since kind of the dawn of humanity, you know, we've basically, you know, our senses were the data, they, they were our point of reference. And as we've grown into, you know, families, to communities, to villages, to towns, to cities, um, we've kind of began to, you know, our point of reference has expanded exponentially. And there's thousands and thousands of data points, or, you know, in some cases, fake data points. Uh, and that's kind of led us on this journey through throughout humanity into, you know, storing things and facts on tablets, um, you know, and then onto books, which up until kind of eight years ago or whatever it was, was really the only way we had of like doing things like that. And, um, you know, we stored them within libraries, but obviously that brings out a lot of problems, especially in an age of globalization. So, um, Two of the obvious ones are searchability and shareability. So if one guy has a copy of a book in a library uh, and it has, you know, 500 pages, it's very difficult to find the information you want uh, and also share it with people as well. So I would have to physically walk to you. And I know that sounds preposterous in the kind of modern age, but walk to you to give you information and updates. Um, and one of the, the lesser obvious ones, uh, and I think it's one that, you know, our misunderstanding of this is kind of what's brought about a lot of the challenges we face now is the integrity of data. So even in a library, um, you know, we assume that because the authors in those books were published, uh, you know, it must be true. There, there must be fact within it. Um, but then there's also a level above that, which is the guy who's maintaining the library and, and keeping various books in that collection um, he could have biases or things he doesn't want the local community to know about. So, and that's really the, the misconception and the, the really the start of the downfall for our failure to understand data and uh, understand our place within it all. Um, and yeah, digital ages came and we've kept a lot of those kind of misconceptions or um, kind of blissful unawareness, as I like to call it. Um, and to give you an example of, um, you know, what I'm kind of talking about here, because that's a bit high level, um, you know, food, you know, how many of us know where our food has came from? Um, you know, when was it picked? Where was it picked? Where did it go through to, to reach us? And uh, a few years ago, IBM challenged Walmart. Uh, they picked a, a lettuce off the shelf and said to them, you know, we want to know where this came from. Can you tell us? And, uh, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to play the guessing game, but uh, it was seven days. Um, was how long it took for them to go through systems, call people, look through paperwork. Um, and that, you know, considering the risks of epidemics or diseases or contaminations, that's a, a grossly crazy long time uh, for us to be able to search through our data and our systems. And I think that's a great epitome of you know, we are so unaware of the scale of the systems that we've built. 
uh, and we have no way to track or understand some of the processes behind them. Um, and to kind of follow in with that example a little more, um, you know, with machine learning and AI, um, there was a kind of famous story last year about uh, some Facebook AI, which, um, you know, started talking to each other in like a, it wasn't another language, but the, the way they were structuring sentences to each other while negotiating for virtual goods made absolutely no sense to humans and they were reaching like positive results. Um, and, you know, this isn't some kind of like far off thing that we've got going on here because, um, you know, machine learning and concepts, concepts like that are already built into, you know, platforms like YouTube where 87 hours of uh, content is uploaded every hour, or no, 87 days in every hour. Uh, and that's just an impossible amount of data to sift through. So we, we've reached this point where we've trained uh, AI to make decisions and, uh, you know, not to kind of scaremonger and, you know, uh, jump and like kind of be on the bandwagon. But, you know, things like extremist content have been continuously pushed and recommended to, you know, younger, more in influenced, uh, you know, members of our, our society. Um, and yeah, that's probably enough kind of scary to mongering for, for one conversation and all that today. Um, and kind of just like I've talked about some of the problems, um, I feel like my company and also the others working in the kind of blockchain space are on the cusp of actual solutions here. Um, and that's kind of the main thing I want to talk to you about today is our, our platform. So um, like uh, Jack, we're also in the kind of side chain and second layer protocol space. Um, and the way we see it is, um, you know, the opportunity to uh, segment data to more relevant people. So um, a guy in Azerbaijan, he doesn't need to know about the lettuce that the Walmart guys and whoever they got it from, you know, he doesn't need to know that. So we're able to use side chains, uh, in particular with enterprises and organizations to segment this, this data into more relevant uh, places uh, and allow them for greater um, ways of customizing and controlling the, their data. Um, and often with these second layer protocols, it means that we're able to drastically reduce a lot of these kind of uh, costs as opposed to main chain transactions and operations. So, um, you know, the majority of traditional blockchains, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, you know, until recently have almost always put all their data on the main chains. And that causes a lot of kind of scalability and congestion challenges going into it. And we have a number of techniques that we're working on to reduce uh, congestion on our platform. Uh, and sidechains is one of the main ones, but um, we've also been looking into um, using logarithmic functions to uh, you know, see the data in different ways and help categorize it and group it uh, in more efficient manners. Um, and here's kind of what we see our sidechains being like in the future. So you'll have an organization who has a, a kind of parent uh, sidechain. And below that, um, we like to call them villages of sidechains. So um, each sidechain will handle a dedicated process um, and can integrate, connect, or cross-communicate with various other sidechains within that village or with internal ex or external parties. And one of the kind of main benefits of that structure that we're pushing is uh, that you can have a range of private, public, and permissions. So if you're a big organization and you have a number of different types of data, you maybe have employee records, you have customer information, but then you also have things like supply chain, which you might want to make transparent for your, your business purposes. Um, we can accustom to all of them. Um, so this is all still quite high level stuff. So um, I want to talk to you a bit about one of the the earlier successes we had with our work, uh, th these guys were actually our first uh, clients, which I'm going to talk about. So um, we've been on a bit of a journey with them uh, and just on our own since then as well, because we only actually founded the company in uh, August 2018. So um, we're actually coming up for our, our year anniversary in about Ooh. 20 days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, basically, um, one of the, the first tools we built um, using our kind of side chains were 
Um, th this system that we call the internal payment system or IPS for short. Um, and it's basically um, the fundamentals of a blockchain plus um, creating your own stable coins. So um, this first customer of ours, uh, they're basically a music uh, streaming and uh, content purchasing platform. And uh, for every you know sale that happens, they're basically a marketplace. So there's artists uh, competing to sell their songs to their users. And for every user with a financial balance on their platform, uh, they have to pay two pound per month per user to uh, Stripe for their Connect services. Uh, and believe it or not, in the UK, there's still 500 uh, companies uh, and marketplaces using this tool. Um, and obviously the, the problems with this is, yeah, they had 5,000 users at the time and were absolutely petrified about scaling because, yeah, every time they scale, that's another £2 every month or, uh, you know, £24 every year. Um, so basically, you know, when we they came to us, they were actually friends of ours originally, but when, when they were talking about this, I was like, this is exactly what we're up to. Um, so we were able to basically... Um, cut out Stripe Connect by accounting for all the balances with a sidechain. So when a payment is sent to their bank account, uh, our IPS system, you know, pings it uh, and reads all the details. Uh, and it basically means that everyone's balance on it, even though it doesn't look like it, is tokens. So um, the user thinks they've deposited for, you know, maybe £10 worth, but it's actually 10 tokens there. Um, and it means that you know, we've completely cut out of this process and saved them £10,000 a month, which um, to me, um, obviously starting out the company is a huge win because it shows our potential when it comes to designing and using our technology for good, but also for the customer because having, uh, you know, £120,000 every year um, to actually utilise and use for good or to expand your, your reach or do new things and exciting and innovative things that's really powerful. And when we design solutions and work with companies, that's what we're looking to do, recreate every single time, is that kind of level of, you know, real overcoming the old and sometimes even eliminating them like this. Um, and one of the, the other things that we see, and uh, Jack talked about this a bit in his presentation, is side chains and, you know, ours uh, more specifically, being uh, a kind of facilitator or a mediator between uh, other chains. So um, right now, you know, there, there's easily over a thousand different blockchains and distributed ledgers being built by various companies or projects or just uh, enthusiasts in the area. And we're going to reach a point where these blockchains have to communicate. They can't just live in their little segregated worlds forever. And we see Sage City and our side chains as being somewhere that can information can be distributed, money can be transferred in a trustless manner. Um, and yeah, so I didn't really talk about myself. I realized um, I've been doing, you know, cryptocurrency and blockchain since about 2012, 2013. And at the time it was, you know, investing. Um, at the time I actually worked in the Scottish government. Um, uh, that, that was an experience. But um, yeah, I, I was investing Bitcoin very early on. Um, and then when I kind of reached the point of really truly understanding it, um, that's where Sage City was born out of. It was this idea that we can actually use this technology now that has reached a point where it can actually do things and we can make a meaningful impact with it. Um, and that's the kind of common... Uh, goal amongst uh, myself and all the team members is we want to make things better and just more simple. Um, we're really against pointless processes and cotton industries and we're really looking for any opportunities to you know change the game and make a lot of the you know the, the deal cuts people and you know scrungy facilitators you know we're looking to make them you know obsolete. Um, yeah, that, that's the end of the, the presentation. 